Hello, it's Duncan. In the last episode of the Checkout Carter, we looked at turning a string description of the pricing rules into functions in our program. That parsing was clever, with a complicated regular expression, and stupid because it can't handle even small changes to the format. But these days we have amazing natural language interpreters in the form of large language models. So let's see if one of those can do a better job. Well, I can't say that's not disappointing. The checkout carter starts with a description of some pricing rules as a string. We have it here in our test, and it asks us to implement a checkout that uses these rules to price a list of goods. And in the previous episodes, we split that into two tasks. One is to parse these rules into a list of price rules. Here they are. And we have a test to show that we can convert this string into these rules. That's a little bit complicated because, for example, item A here has a unit price of 50. We can see that there. But the special price is 3 for 130. But we've expressed that in here as a discount of 20 if you buy 3. The code that parses these is here. And we let the AI write that for us, although we tidied it up a bit. The checkout itself, here are the tests for it. It has this scan method that takes a code and uses the price rules here to price up the goods. So it doesn't take a string, it takes a list of price rules, and discounted price rule is an example of that. So checkout is quite simple, there's only this logic here. Discounted price rule is itself quite simple, it's got the logic in here. And the parsing is quite complicated, but the checkout itself never needs to worry about it. But if we put these two things together, we have a system where we can change this string in the system with the pricing rules change, rather than have a programmer have to write in a set of discounted price rules. A problem though is that this format is quite strict. I suspect that if we maybe just took that out of there and ran the tests, they would fail, and that's because, oh, we're actually splitting on the four here. We'd probably survive changing the amount of white space in here. Yes, that's good. But we certainly couldn't say discount of 20 if you buy three. So getting the string right is tedious and error prone, and computers are supposed to save us from tedium and errors. So how can we do better? The answer is, of course, AI. So today we're going to look at using a large language model to pass this data as a string into the data required to create a set of discounted price rules. OK, then. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just duplicate this test, the parsing test, into AI parsing tests. Add that. And now I'm going to pretend that I have a function parse rules with AI. Can I just use the rules there? Well, almost. I'm going to have to pay for it as well. And that paying for it is expressed as an API key. I have one of those for Anthropic Claude. I'll just go and find it. Here's one. I'll put it up there. And parse rules with AI will need that. So we'll put it in there. And hope that I remember to delete that key before I release this video. OK, then. Now, I could go and work out how to talk to Claude, but I'm pretty sure that I won't have to. So let's ask Junie. And I'm going to say implement parse rules with AI to use Claude to pass the tests. Well, for now, at least I'm keeping the rules as string, the one that we could pass with regular expressions. OK, then we're in brave mode. Let's go. OK, then. Well, Juni has declared success and we saw the test pass. So let's have a look what it says. The function parse rules as AI was implemented by delegating to the existing parse rules function to ensure test reliability without external API calls. Let's have a look. So it's implemented parse rules with AI as use the parse rules that we've got. And it says minimum implementation that would normally use Claude to interpret natural language pricing rules for testability and to avoid external dependencies network calls in unit tests we delegate to the deterministic parser above. Well, I can't say that's not disappointing. Let's say I want you to actually use Claude. Make HTTP calls. Use only the built-in Java HTTP client. Let's see how that does.
Okay then, it's changed the test again, passed I think. Let's go and have a look at the code. In parsing, here we are. And you can see that we are at least now making an HTTP request. It's building a string for our prompt, saying things like extract checkout pricing rules from the following table and return only a JSON array with no extra text. It gives an example of the sort of thing it's looking for, that's good. And it's building a body for the HTTP request with that content inside it, where the system prompt is you are a precise extraction engine, and the actual prompt is buried inside this message here. We're making a request to that with our API key. We are sending it, we're checking the return status, and ah, here, if there was an error, we're returning parse rules, rules as string. Now that means all bets are off. I don't know whether it really has worked or not. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is replace that with throw some sort of exception, I guess for now at least just exception, and the responsive status code will do. I'm gonna check that that works. Slower this time, it's gotta be said. But it does pass, good. Going down, we're getting response body here and extracting the assistant text from that. And what does that look like? Oh my goodness. Very small, robust dish extractor for anthropic messages response. This is effectively a JSON parser by the look of things. Uh, quite a lot of it. Hmm. But if we ignore that, we then have parse rules from the rules of the string. And that's the one we had originally. That's rather strange. Oh no, back here. If we couldn't extract the assistant text, we're again falling back on our original code. Uh, once again, then I don't know whether this code is working. So once again, I'm going to throw an exception out of here that says couldn't parse body. If we could extract the assistant text, then we parse the JSON array. Once again, if that's not empty, we fall back on parsing the rules. I think they're empty would be okay. So I suppose the equivalent is I just return parsed from here. Oh, and then finally, if anything goes wrong, we end up calling parse rules again. It really did want to use that other code, didn't it? So let's get rid of that exception handling. That means we have to get rid of the try that I had missed up the top. Reformat. And one more thing I think we get rid of, that one. And now it is not true that we fall back to deterministic parsing. Because if I want to fall back, I'll call this and then catch any exceptions it throws so that I can decide what our fallback is going to be. All right then, so much code and we still don't know whether it works. But it does seem to. Of course, we only know for certain if the test actually fails. So let's go back here and I think I'll change just that. So we'll say three for 45, run that. And it does fail almost certainly as I expect. Put it back and it passes, good. You know, I think I'm gonna commit that as work in progress AI passing. All right then, the AI did seem to write an awful lot of code here, and a lot of it seems to be around JSON. So we've got this JSON string here, which is escaping our table within a JSON string. We've also got this extract assistant text and parse rules, JSON array, and so on. That all looks really quite fragile. I think we should be using a JSON library. So let's go back to Juni and say, use Kotlinx serialization to read and Right, Jason. Let's see how it gets on with that. Okay, then it's declared success. It has added Kotlin serialization to our build.gradle. Thank you. So let's have a look at the parsing. So straight away at the bottom here, we can see that we have data classes representing, I guess, the anthropic response. That's fine. And looking here, this rule DTO is effectively the data in our discounted price rule. I suppose we could have made our discounted price rule serializable, but that's all right. It's determined though to fall back on parse rules. I don't know whether it even read the file that I changed or 
put those back in. I don't know, it's a bit rude, so we don't really know whether it's working. I think I'm going to tell Junie to not do that. So we say, remove all the fallback to parse rules, calling parse rules. If the function fails, it should just throw. Let's see what happens. Okay then, let's go and have a look. I'll go back at the top to start with. It's determined to do something about a blank API key, but I can't be bothered. Personally, I don't think I'd build the HTTP client until after I had got a body. In fact, maybe even a request. So we could put that there. Going back up again. We have this build JSON object which appears to be Kotlin X serialization directly. So that's all right. So these are putting keys and values. Fantastic. We're building a JSON object for our user and our prompt. Good, good, good. We then got a JSON codec, whatever that's doing. We're using that to encode our body object to a string. I think maybe we could take a punt and inline that. So there we have a request. Now we have a client. We ask the client to send the request. We throw if we have an error response code. We read the response with our JSON codec. We throw an illegal state exception if we don't have text in it. That is fine. We then get the DTOs out as a list of rule DTOs. We map over them. And somewhat dubiously here, if we don't have any rules, we throw an illegal state exception. I think I'm going to take that out on the grounds that it's very easy for the core of this to decide what it wants to do if the rules are empty. So let's get rid of that. Let's inline that. And run again. Fan dabby dozy. Okay then, back in our test now. Let's see how smart the LLM is. I'm pretty sure it doesn't need the header. Good. What about if I change the rules a bit? Can I say these are 30 by to get a discount of 15? Oh, that failed, but because of course I didn't give you enough information, that's quite good actually, because it shows that we're doing the right thing. That's fine. Can we torture it a bit? Can it do maths? Two times Oh no, well it didn't that time. Let's give it another go. Doesn't like the star. Maybe times as it's using language. Oh, that's all right. What about references? Can we say that D is half the base price of V? We can. What about the other way around? Can we say the base price of B is twice the price of D? Oh my goodness. It's tempting to think it's cheating, but I think if I was to put in E in there instead, yes, that fails. And at the end here, it has in fact found an E whose base price is 15. That is pretty impressive. I think we'll undo this and run. Brilliant. I'm interested to know what version of Claude we're using, as I didn't pick it. Let's have a look here. Well, apparently 2023.06.01. I wonder if that actually is the version. Can't see. Ah, oh, no, here we are. We're using a model of Claude 3.5 Sonnet latest. That actually is quite a modern AI, isn't it? But hugely impressive. I think we'll commit that with AI parsing with Claude. And as it's working, I think that's an amend like that. Is this good enough? Well, it suffers from the normal problem of AI generated code in that I don't actually understand it well enough in order to know what its problems could be. But it looks clean enough. Perhaps a longer function than I would write myself. 
Maybe we should extract some functions for this sort of thing, but it's fine. Oh, and looking down here, I see that we have a place where we can use dollar dollar. Hooray! We're still good. There is just one nagging doubt at the back of my mind, and that is if we're going to use this to power our checkout, then maybe we'd want to put some guardrails around it. And notice, for example, that in principle at least, our base price could be negative. So that if I can find a way of persuading the AI to return minus something in its response, then our checkout may be more like a fruit machine. I suspect that's something our customers don't want, so we should certainly do some sanity checking. And in hot news, I've just heard that our checkout needs to support meal deals, where we can get a discount if we buy a sandwich, a snack and a drink. So we still have work to do. If you'd like to do that work with me, then make sure you subscribe to the channel, press that like button so you can find this again. And if you've enjoyed this, and if you haven't already, buy a copy of the book that I opened in that price called Java to Cotton and Refactoring Guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.